Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, so, th this, uh, you, you've been given this book, and associated with the book, the publishers have a website where you can download um, the figures, um, but one of the complaints about the book is that you people can go through it and then they suddenly find there's all these color plates uh, in, in the middle. Um, and they, unfortunately, those are not on uh, the website. But if, you, if you'd like any copies of any of those, uh, then do let me know. W we've also created another website where I put up all of the Excel spreadsheets that we use to create many of the diagrams there, and which may have mistakes. And so um, if you want to go and check anything with any of the new diagrams, um, or see how they were constructed, then, then you can just simply download those from that site. And obviously, we're very interested to know of errors that you may find. The other thing that we've put up there uh, is some short course material about um, the carbonate system and how you can, you can use simple chemical models um, in conjunction with drip water data to get a, an understanding about how the carbon s carbonate system is behaving. Um, so I, I gave this as a short course at the KR6 meeting in Birmingham a couple of years ago. So there's a PowerPoint presentation, there are various um, exercises in Excel uh, spreadsheets, and there's some uh, software. The software is actually rather old. It's a program called Mix4. It's not as, it's like a very cut down version of, of Freak but actually it's really simple to use and it's actually a, a, um, uh, very good as a learning tool and, and gives outputs which are, are, are fine for the carbonate system. Um, so if any of you want to have more information about that, if you'd like copies of the files, I can give you copies here. Um, or if anyone wants uh, to learn about this in any more detail, then you know, maybe one of the lunch times I could uh, uh, provide some more information if you're interested. So this book then we wrote um, uh, as primarily as a book for um, researchers in, in Spiritham uh, science. And so uh, my experience and Andy Baker's experience of, of um, working with um, early career researchers in, uh, in this area has been very productive. We've had lots of wonderful people um, working with us and then they get uh, their PhD degrees and everyone's uh, very proud about that. So then it, it sets me thinking about what was it like when I got my PhD, you know, a long, long time ago now. It was actually 1978. And I was in the Arctic at the time with these strange people. Um, I missed my PhD ceremony. I didn't get to dress up in that, in that gown until years later. Um, but one strange thing that occurred to me was that we've been looking at great detail at certain stalagmites that tell us about things that happened um, in, in fine detail. And the most extraordinary specimen is one uh, from Obia Cave, from Christoph's Cave there, this one, where we have here what happened in a single year. And look at the number of events that can be resolved. This is from the uh, concentration of zinc in this particular sample in a single year. So 1978 then, I, you know, I was getting my PhD about here so we can look and kind of think about, was it raining in Austria um, on, on that day? Well, we can't quite get that far, but the ultimate limit of what could be um, found in, in certain spidiothems is, is really quite extraordinary. But as we know, it's not always a simple business to extract the signal that we want. So I'm going to try and take a systematic approach to the issue of trace elements by um, trying to encourage um, thinking about what the controls might be on, s on trace element uh, incorporation, um, understanding um, something of the cave context, which is obviously easier if it's a modern sample. If it's a very old sample, of course, the cave context may have changed. So taking advantage of all the ancillary information that may be available to help interpret um, what, the, 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 what the trace elements are telling us. Because in many cases, they can give us complementary information to that which you can obtain by other means. So firstly, we'll look at um, where the elements are. Where are they in? And you might say, this is silly. They're in the spilly of them. They're in the stalagmite. They're just sitting there. But they're not always sitting in the same place. And how they get there and how they're transported there does vary between different elements. Uh, so there's Pauline Treble, 
And uh, so we wrote this overview article a few years ago looking at trace elements, and one of the things that we pointed out was that um, elements may be transported into the cave environment and onto the Spilly FM surface, um, either as particles, micron-sized materials, or as solutes, completely dissolved materials, or as something in between. And it's become increasingly um, apparent that the something in between, what we call colloids, are actually really quite important agents of transport of many elements into caves, um, and, uh, and, and which then form part of the distinctive geochemistry of the stalagmites that we see preserved. And the person that's done most to, to work on this is, is Adam Hartland, who has the distinction of getting Chris Hendy's old job in uh, Waikato in, uh, in, in New Zealand. Um, and so uh, Adam did a PhD on this, and he's gra gradually publishing the results um, from it. So he pointed out that if you start looking and collecting the colloidal material from waters, from drip waters, for example, then you find that uh, they are very diverse. Uh, these are what I've called coarse colloids. That is, they may be up to a, a few hundred nanometers across or a few tens of nanometers across. And commonly, the particles that you find are composites uh, of organic molecules of iron oxides, alumino um, uh, silicates. And uh, this is a TEM um, uh, chemical measurement that's showing that there's, there's iron and silica and aluminium and some phosphorus all together in, this, in these particles. Um, so that's some examples of, of coarse colloids, and exactly what you get will depend on the cave context. And these are some examples of fine colloids, and these are probably much more common uh, and, and similar in, other, in different environments, because these are, uh, are, are macromolecules, they're, they're humic uh, materials. Um, you can see that the individual spherical materials here are only about three or four microns across uh, at, at most. And it turns out from Adam's work that you, you get different characteristic um, associations of metals with these different types of colloids. So it's not, it's not uh, and, and actually that's helpful because uh, if, you, if you recognize that, there are more things that you can, um, there are more axes of variation that you can use to interpret the spiliothems. So there is some theoretical justification for understanding what's going on here in terms of the binding of metals specifically to organic um, macromolecules in that um, this, this axis tells us um, something about the affinity of an element for water and how much it hydrolyzes. Um, and this axis tells us something about what proportion of a metal is bound to um, organic ligands. And so we have the, the elements that we're familiar with as the, the alkaline earth elements here, which um, are typically present as uh, individual ions surrounded by uh, water molecules. On the other hand, somewhere up here, something like thorium, we know that thorium hates the idea of going into solution. It's always in, in particulate uh, form in these kinds of environments. And in between, we've got a whole spectrum of elements and, uh, which may actually vary their behavior depending on the exact water composition. But many of the ones in the middle here actually are ones that do turn out to, to bind quite significantly to um, humic substances and to other colloids in caves. Um, this is an example of how you might go about trying to work out is an element associated with a colloid or, or not. And the problem is it's, it's actually not always straightforward to answer the question. So what's been done here is to take, uh, raw refers to the bulk sample without any filtering. And then as we go towards the left of the diagram, um, the sample has been filtered with finer and finer filters. Um, down here to um, 100, uh, what's that, that's, that's, uh, that, that's 0.1 microns, that's 100 nanometers, um, 10 nanometers, and that's one nanometer. And so uh, the idea is to look and see if the concentration of an element varies depending on how much um, ultrafiltration you've attached to it. So we can see here that the total organic carbon content goes down uh, somewhat, but, uh, um, and actually analytically it gets very difficult to, to determine it if you have a fine filter because of blank issues. Um, but we can see, for example, with copper and nickel in this particular environment, their concentrations diminish quite a lot once you start filtering the solutions 
So these are primarily, in this particular cave, associated in, with coarse colloids. On the other hand, you have an element like cobalt, which doesn't change very much. And in this case, we're pretty sh we know that this is associated with very fine colloids. But that's actually a similar pattern to something like uh, bromine or strontium, where we, don't, where we think they're just in solution and they're not attached to colloids at all. So if you've got a coarse colloid, you can use this technique to, 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 to identify that. But if you've got a very fine colloid, actually you can't use this method to tell uh, if the element is attached to a colloid or not. It's, it's, uh, you, have to use other, you, know, you have to use other arguments to uh, arrive at that conclusion. So if we look in, in general at, you know, we have stalagmites, and if we, if we analyze them, I mean, to a first approximation, you, you expect that you, you analyze a stalagmite and you, and you record its total chemistry. But actually, there are some subtle differences between what you actually measure depending on the technique that you use. Um, for example, if you use SIMS, if you use iron probe, uh, what that technique does, as soon as it encounters a fluid inclusion, is to volatilize it instantaneously. Um, and so, in steady state, you actually don't record those fluid inclusions. Um, if you um, use a solution ICPMS technique, uh, that won't uh, uh, record the particles. So if there's anything that's coarser in the particle, it will settle out to the bottom of the tube, and you won't record it um, in, by your solution ICPMS um, method. Um, and, of course, if, you, if you're using a leaching protocol of some sort, then you might not um, leach all of the uh, material. You may partially leach some of the materials that are, uh, that are there. So there are, some, there are some interesting subtleties about uh, which relate to the methods of chemical analysis. Now, Andrea is going to be speaking about methods a little bit later. And as he says, you know, in a sense, that's the most important thing, is to get good, get good data and to be aware of what the different techniques actually do. So this is a diagram that uh, Pauline and I published, which um, summarizes um, some of the, th the different processes that can occur, which affect the abundance of, of trace elements. Um, and, and so in some cases, the trace elements are atmospherically um, derived. And it's not always obvious what is atmospherically derived. Um, then there are all kinds of modifications in the soil and epicast, dissolution from bedrock, dissolution from uh, superficial materials, uh, from quaternary deposits, and by interactions with the soil um, biota and the soil um, materials. And then in the cave environment itself, there are these processes that are going on, which are modifying the, the, the fluid chemistry. Then you reach the stage at which uh, Sylvia gets particularly interested, and we have the stage of crystallization, and we have fractionation or partitioning of elements um, in that process of crystallization. And then the specter of diagenesis hanging over us. Is there some secondary change that could modify that? And Sylvia's giving you some clues as to how to recognize that. Um, so um, one of the, uh, this diagram sort of illustrates, you know, a, a way of trying to conceptualize what some of these processes are like. And, and, and this sort of approach using these, um, uh, the, using these kinds of models has been developed um, recently, most actively by Andy Baker and Chris Bradley, who published quite a number of papers now looking at oxygen isotope um, patterns. And I know, of course, that in, in the um, Daphne project, there's been a lot of effort expended too in terms of looking at, at, at holistic models about how we uh, at uh, looking at, uh, at many of these um, uh, processes. Um, and. Uh, one theoretical concept which I found really very valuable, which we've mentioned in the, in the, in the book, is the concept of um, process length, which is something that uh, Matt Covington, who was a mathematically minded uh, cast scientist, has been uh, expressing. Um, the process length is a representative length over which an external signal is damped out. And so this concept of process length gets you to think about the cave as a system where signals are transmitted to it, some of the signals um, become damped out very close to the entrance to the cave. Other signals can penetrate quite deep into the cave. So, for example, if you have water coming in, the fracture-fed flow can go quite deep into that cave environment. And similarly, if you think about the air, um, the relative humidity and temperature signals that we see outside are damped out very quickly 
into a cave, but changing patterns of CO2 abundance uh, can actually characterize an entire and enormous cave network penetrating up to kilometers inside the ground because of the relative efficiency of air circulation. So um, I think that this conceptually, in terms of processes, I think I found this a really rewarding thing to, to, to think about. And uh, um, so, you know, the development of a more theoretical approach to how cave systems function, I think this is, this is quite, a, quite useful. And one example of a, a large cave system where you can explore some of these co concepts is the Avandorniac in, in uh, France, where Jacques Bourges and colleagues have um, done some really super monitoring work and come up with these quite complex models about how the cave system uh, responds uh, um, uh, over time. So um, if you're interested in, in the process functioning in caves, th th this, these works are very, uh, very interesting. So then, in terms of the trace elements, um, we developed this, uh, well, in fact, in terms of spinithems generally, we, we developed this, this uh, approach um, of, of the different controls on spinithems in our 2006 paper. And, and many of the people in this uh, photograph here were involved in a, a project at the time which, where we, these concepts were developed. If we are looking at atmospheric controls or soil controls or cave controls, um, these are affecting the actual composition of the water, the, that's the composition of the ions that are present in the water. Whereas um, the process of crystallization imposes a filter which changes this and, and, and modifies this. So the relationship to um, the water chemistry becomes a little bit less, less direct. And so it's something that, that makes the record a little bit less um, clear. It's like the equivalent of you know, kinetic controls in, in terms of stabilized steps. That's the same kind of issue you have. It's a distortion of the, um, of the water composition. And then uh, clearly, um, diagenetic effects. And Sylvia's just shown you a lovely example where you can, you can produce a chemical map and you can see diagenetic alteration. On the other hand, if you see a chemical map that shows you primary growth zones, you can use that to give you confidence that you haven't got diagenetic alteration. Now let's look at atmospheric sources for a little bit. Now lots of times people have said to me, oh, if only, w let's just measure the sodium or the chloride content of our stalagmite and it will tell us about the salinity of the water. In my experience, it doesn't. Um, the chloride doesn't um, actually fractionate in any sensible way into calcium carbonate. It's likely to be mainly present in, in fluid inclusions. And sodium, likewise, is just, just does its own thing. It's like a recalcitrant teenager. It doesn't behave very well at all. Um, so if you want to learn about what's happening in the atmosphere, you probably have to look at other uh, chemical components. And uh, strontium isotopes have been used in a number of successful studies. Uh, you have to understand the sources of strontium, but they've often shown to be actually quite interesting in, in telling us about uh, changing sources. Uh, I'll say something about sulfate in a moment. Um, and there may be other traces where the uh, the, a the actual uh, soil and, and bedrock don't contain very much of a particular element, but where the atmosphere is an important source of it, and that will be uh, depend on the, the particular context. So in a given case, there may be some distinctive component that tells us about atmospheric sources. Um, and indeed, uh, when we think about trace metals, we know now that there's, you know, pollution is very widespread, that even pristine environments do have... Um, uh, all kinds of pollutants coming from uh, far uh, from far away, um, and actually understanding the way that trace metals are added to a site, are bound or not bound by the soil, and then transmitted. That's actually quite an interesting um, issue. Uh, in some cases, for example, you know, phosphorus in steady state might be might be um, actually limited by its supply atmospherically. Well, this is an example of how we've come to understand better um, uh, the sulfur system by, by looking in speleothems and looking also in trees. So we've got a tree expert here, um, Peter from Kiel University. Atmospherically, then, we've got this, um, in, in, in Western Europe, this big spike in pollution um, in the um, 1960s and 1970s. In some other parts of the world, we are still at peak pollution in terms of uh, sulfur, much of which is derived by burning um, 
pyrite bearing sulfide, sulfide bearing coal. Um, in the case of this Ernesto cave environment in northeastern Italy, the trees see the increasing sulfur first, and um, the, the sulfur is actually trapped in, uh, in proteins in the inner cell wall, so it's actually quite, quite well trapped there. And here we can see it rising. It's actually it's continuing to rise even after the atmospheric source is declining because of the storage in the soil and, eco, um, and other parts of the ecosystem. Stalagmites are also rising, but there's a little bit of a delay before they, 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 they start to rise. And now in the cave itself, and in fact since the early 2000s, the amount of sulfate in the cave environment has been diminishing. But there is this, this um, lag effect, an attenuation effect of the atmospheric signal, but we do see it. And obviously there are several colleagues very interested in also the impacts of volcanic eruptions on spilithem forming environments. They will introduce all kinds of um, new elements and different abundances. And the question about how the, this, the spilithem forming environment responds in terms of lags or attenuation is really important. But uh, that, that's, you know, that will be a very fruitful area for um, future research. Now, considering the soil and the, um, and the epicast, um, well, we know the importance of high CO2 in the soil zone and how that is driving carbonate dissolution. We can see here clearly the, the, the complex role that um, enhanced flow pathways would have. And there's some caves just sitting, sitting in here, just waiting for water to nourish stalagmites. Um, well, in, in that book that's been published, we've actually compiled together literature data about um, uh, to give an overview about where elements that you see in a cast water may have come from. So um, there are many relatively insoluble phases um, which will nevertheless yield distinctive um, elemental signals. So, you know, it may be if, the, if you have some barium sulfate, for example, that barium may be distinctively sourced from that. Um, and because these phases dissolve very slowly, Sometimes you find an enrichment in the ions that are produced from them in waters that have got a long residence time in your aquifer. And if you've got a situation where you've got a drought and you have only very little water coming through, these, these elements that are from these relatively less soluble phases may be concentrated in the water and may give you a signal um, of that. Then we've got the issue about how quickly calcite dissolves compared with dolomite. And um, so if we have a bedrock of a certain composition, in this case it's, um, it's just 10% um, uh, dolomite, by the time it's um, uh, dissolved to saturation at either a low PCO2 or a high PCO2, the magnesium-calcium ratio gets lower. And that's because calcite is dissolving more quickly than dolomite, um, and so we get an offset from that. Um, and so the, the water composition will almost invariably be different from the, the average composition of the bedrock because of this difference in the dissolution kinetics. Uh, and only once have I actually found an example where, the, where I've got um, a water which is very close to dolomite uh, uh, composition because normally there's a small amount of calcite there which is dissolving more rapidly and influencing the chemistry. So, and this diagram looks further at the dissolution kinetics of different uh, minerals. We've looked at the solubility. And this is now the kinetics. Um, and generally speaking, minerals that are insoluble also tend to dissolve very slowly. But there are some differences. And we've got pH here along this axis because as you dissolve a mineral, typical m most minerals are, are, are reacting with, um, uh, with CO2. Um, and so as you go to higher pHs, the amount of CO2 diminishes, and then the rates of dissolution often uh, diminish as well. Um, clearly, this, this doesn't apply to a, a sulfate mineral, for example, which is not affected by pH. Um, and so with calcite, we can see its rate of dissolution dropping off as it approaches saturation. And there isn't experimental work on dolomite to see exactly what it does. So I mentioned just now that if you had minerals that dissolve very um, that are very insoluble or which dissolve slowly, you might expect to see them concentrated in waters uh, at low flow. And I, I just realized, just before I came out this morning, that I just put this picture of Dominique Gionti in here. 
drinking this is a favorite dish in the Dordogne. This is a, a wine-based drink. And it suddenly realized that this was appropriate for this concept because at the bottom of that, there'll be some dregs, some solid dregs left. And so you can imagine, think of Dominique, think of the dregs left when he's drinking like that. And here in VR Cave, which he's uh, studied intensively, at low discharge in the dry summer season, the, um, sorry, the low discharge in the so summer season, the strontium content of the waters is increasing, presumably because it's drawing on a reservoir. You know, if you have a car and you nearly run out of petrol, sometimes there's some sediment at the bottom of the petrol tank. <coughs> Think of it as like that. There's, there's some, some a more uh, a concentrated material that you're just seeing coming through at low flow. So in some cases, then, there may be a chemical signal that, that's associated with that. Uh, and I don't know how common that is. This is one particular example. It may or may not be... Uh, uh, more widespread. Perhaps more attention has been found recently in the opposite case, where you get very high flow giving you high concentrations of trace elements, but they're not the same trace elements. So here we've got someone, this is the Ganges River, it's high, you know, it's very turbid, there's lots of suspended sediment. Um, at high flow, you expect all kinds of things to come through in the water. And, and so, um, it, it was actually um, Andy Baker in his early career who, who spent a lot of time looking at these fluorescent annual uh, laminae that we see in an, a number of spilithems in, in uh, cool temperate environments. And so th these seem to be quite common. Um, they appear to represent a time of the year when uh, vegetation is dying back and where there's more opportunity to flush fluorescent organic matter from the soil into the cave. So they're, uh, as we'll see in a moment, it's, they're not necessarily telling us distinctively when the drip rate was highest in the year, but they're actually telling us something about the overall annual pattern of um, the change in the soil ecosystem, as well as the hydrology. Um, and uh, you recognize uh, these people. Um, so the Ernesto Cave has proved to be a fantastic testbed of ideas about uh, understanding how caves function over the years, where many different parameters have been investigated. And in this particular case, in the Ernesto example, th th this one is uh, a stalagmite from the Ernesto Cave, these beautiful fluorescent laminae. Um, and here is the paper by Osato et al, where these, are, um, these laminae are imaged um, and excitingly, this group of very, very prominent laminae here seems to correspond with a time when there was deforestation above the cave, and it seems to be, you know, we're making a connection between there that actually this is more active hydrology coming in with, with, uh, um, into the system, bringing more exotic trace elements through. And in this case, by stacking the chemical composition of those layers up, we, we see very distinctively which trace elements are enriched. And I would guess now that... Um, we may be possibly seeing a, a, a composite of this, something like yttrium is probably uh, an element that's, that's characteristic of quite coarse colloids. Um, uh, so uh, following from Adam Harton's work now, we have to think about some other elements too, which may or may not um, show similar uh, patterns to these. And the other thing that was noticed in this study was the way that strontium dips down here. And so we're finding this more and more, that, that strontium variation is often a passive response to incorporation of other elements which get in there first. It's a bit like you're waiting at a bus stop for a bus um, and you are a polite person, uh, let's say who would be polite, uh, Megan for example, polite person. Um, other people around you just get onto the bus and then the door shuts, there's no room for it. So it's, it's like that strontium is the polite element uh, that gets shut out. It, it can incorporate, and we, we know it substitutes for calcium, but it can also go into some defect sites but if other, other elements are more strongly attracted to those defect sites, and they'll go there in preference. And so if we have a favorable case, like this uh, stalagmite from Obia cave, um, which is very sensitive, um, and we've got a, a, a enough of a suitable element. This is, this is zinc, and with, with, this is, I showed on the first slide, these very, very uh, wonderful zinc-enriched uh, laminae. Uh, this is shown on a much finer scale. Here we see the annual enrichment in zinc. This is on a bench top x-ray fluorescence uh, instrument, which I was testing, but never had the money to buy, uh, whereas this is, uh, this is on a, a synchrotron XRF. So it will be fun to, uh, as, these, as this technology develops, to make more use of this, t uh, of this technology, because you, know, you can just have an ordinary microscope of, of the sort that 
um, uh, Sylvia was stressing that you should use. And on, on that scale, you can now get uh, instruments that can, that can give you X-ray fluorescence maps. And so I think this, I think this will be really powerful in, in checking this important thing that Sylvia has mentioned about looking for secondary change. Because even if you can't see all the details, if you can at least see some chemical variation which is parallel to the, the growth, um, then at least you may have some confidence that you've got a primary uh, fabric. Um, okay, go, thinking again about the, the high flu uh, these high flux events, these flushing events when um, colloids come into the cave. Um, uh, Adam Hartland went to Ernesto in 2007. It didn't rain. That was no good. He went back in 2008. He was lucky. Had some quite had some quite a lot of rain going on at the time. Um, and although the patterns are not, you know, they're not that easy to interpret. One of the things that can be seen is that certain elements like aluminium, manganese, and copper diminish quite a lot um, after the, these, this um, uh, rainfall event. And so he would interpret those as indicating that those particular elements are in a coarse colloidal fraction. Um, but this, this, it's actually, this is quite difficult work to do, to actually collect um, the waters at the, at the crucial time when the flush is, is occurring. So there's a lot more observational evidence we need to really to firm up exactly what is, is going on. Now, one of the things that's come out of Adam's work, then, is this concept that you, you have characteristically different types of behavior of these colloid transported elements. Um, and you can recognize this by these cross plots of one element against another. Um, so if we look at copper and nickel, for example, um, uh, we show um, copper is an element that's very often enriched in the coarse colloids. Um, and so if you get a trend like that, um, that's a trend which is characteristically associated with um, high flux events when we're getting more of the co coarse colloids coming in, whereas the low flux trend is, is more typical of the background uh, flow, which can actually occur all the way through the year. So when we started this work, we thought that we would only see these colloids at very high flow events. That was the model that was in our mind. But it's now appear, uh, very apparent that you get uh, the very fine humic materials that are only nanometer scale in size. They come through all the year, but in addition, you get a higher concentration of them and, and um, uh, also um, you get um, the coarse, coarse colloidal material um, at, at uh, periods of high flow. And this is an article that's in um, in submission, uh, which takes this a bit further. And th this is the low flux trend we've just seen there, and, which, and he's labeling that now as acid soluble dissolved organic matter. And, and the claim that's now being made then is that this, this distinctive difference in the ratio of different metals is actually telling us something about the, the ligands and the binding sites for the metals. And further, in this case, where there is a change in the ratio between the relatively young parts of the sample and the thousand-year older record, that we're coming to a stage now in the 20th century where the ratio is, seems to be changing and shifting quite um, strongly in one direction. And this has been interpreted as a temperature shift related to different types of organic matter being released from soils at uh, a temperature threshold. So um, it's not been accepted by referees yet, but this is the, the, the claim. And in fact, there's quite a big debate going on in people who look at organic carbon um, in rivers and derived from soils as to whether there's a temperature control or pH control on the release of organic matter. And this, this claim here is that it's actually related to uh, temperature shifts. So, uh, so a claim then that there is a paleo temperature proxy involved um, in these trace element ratios. Now, the NK processes, these, these are um, now really, um, many of them are becoming quite well known. You're familiar with these, these kinds of diagrams that I've used to illustrate prior calcite precipitation and, um, and changing uh, sources at low flow. Um, there's some nice work that uh, Dan Sinclair and um, Daryl Tremaine uh, have published and have got in press. Uh, we're stressing that actually to, to identify prime calcite precipitation, it's probably best to plot a magnesium calcium versus a strontium calcium directly rather than putting them on separate diagrams. The advantage of using these diagrams is that it tells you something else about the way 
um, the K, uh, uh, about the way the caste system is functioning by looking at the calcium concentrate and looking at the uh, inferring how high the PCO2 is. Um, so there's interest in that, and then in the in the book the we then look at how the morphology of speleothems also might be uh, reflective of these different situations, and uh, also the magnesium calcium ratio rising and how that relates to the change in the isotope signatures as we look along a flow line within a cave. And these are obviously, as soon as you, whenever you go in a cave, we went into a cave yesterday, these sort of questions were kept coming up, people often making comments about thinking about what's happening along a flow line. So um, this is now very well established in the literature. Now in certain caves, these kind of um, processes come to dominate the trace element signatures. So in Emily McMillan's work on um, uh, some stalagmites from Clamouse, we, fo we found that this, this annual, there was an annual scale variation in magnesium and strontium, and we found that they correlated with each other very well. And that would be a signature of prior calcite precipitation uh, getting stronger seasonally. And this is a cave with a very strong summer drought. And this, this change seasonally actually culminated in a um, uh, in the deposition of aragonite d during um, a, an arid phase about 1,200 uh, years ago. Um, now, the, b the behavior um, of caves, um, surprisingly, doesn't bear much relationship to how big they are. Um, so when plotting this data, I was really quite shocked to find that you have a little tiny cave like Ernesto, or an enormous cave like Nerja Cave in, in southern Spain, and have actually got pretty much the same seasonal variation in PCO2 of the cave air, and hence in, in, in the pH of, of slow drip, uh, drip water. Uh, and, but then some other cases have got much stronger changes. Um, so that just illustrates how powerful the air circulation mechanism is. And the consequences for seasonal changes in the rate of speleothem growth were first documented quantitatively by Dominique Gentil, um, uh, in, in different sites, and, and clearly this is this is really quite uh, important. And then we have uh, Dave Matty's joined us now, I see, and there he is uh, in his element um, with a battery of element el um, instruments in front of him. And this monitoring work at uh, uh, Lower St. Michael's Cave in Gibraltar is a fantastic example of, of how our uh, uh, understanding has been advanced and confirmed by really detailed monitoring. Now, Gibraltar is an unusual cave because it's a cave where the CO2 is actually higher in the winter than the summer, and it's related to the particular um, uh, situation that is in Gibraltar. It's, it's an unusual case. But because, um, because the CO2 is higher in the winter, it means the summer is a time of low CO2, which is promoting prior calcite precipitation. The summer is also a time of drought, which independently promotes calcite calcite precipitation. So you combine the two things uh, together and you get these really nice strong annual signals in, in strontium and magnesium and you're getting quite big variations. At some cave sites however these two processes can be fighting each other. You may have a situation where you have low PCO2 in winter promoting calcite precipitation but you may have a drought in summer which is promoting calcite precipitation there. And the, and the two things could cancel out. And there's, there's one particular example that Emily McMillan looked at where we thought that from year to year, one was winning and then the other was winning because we were getting such complicated patterns. Um, but at Gibraltar, it's great because everything um, goes in the same direction. And then this lovely work uh, by Cruz et al. is showing that these kinds of variations, this is in strontium and magnesium, are occurring over Milankovitch scale cycles. And this is really very encouraging that the hydrological uh, controls um, in this case are, are um, actually manifesting themselves in terms of the trace element variation. And clearly, given that this, you know, this control over a long time scale, you know, if, if you, could, you could then look at samples of this sort in both very short and very long time scales, and, and uh, I know a wealth of information would be recovered. But of course, you've got to get the right sample in the right cave where the samples are responsive to these sorts of um, uh, processes. Um, something else that we've looked at recently, this is John Dredge, and this is the article he published in Quaternary Science Reviews earlier in the year, looking explicitly at the role of aerosols in caves. Um, and one thing we did was to check um, the Obia cave again, because 
we were not clear whether the high um, zinc content in the stalagmites could come from the water because we we hadn't measured we, we hadn't measured zinc, but it, it, we were worried that we hadn't measured enough zinc in the drip water to explain the peaks, and so we were wondering whether it's possible it could have come from aerosol. So um, there's been collections going on for a few months of collecting aerosol and looking at the aerosol flux, and it turns out that in fact um, the aerosol flux is several orders of magnitude too low to explain uh, the content of, uh, of elements like zinc, and the drip water is only just enough, but that might be because we haven't collected the water at all the appropriate times. So that was, that was quite helpful, but it then draws attention to the fact that enrichment in aerosol materials is, of course, going to be much more important when you have very slow growth or at hiatuses. And here, this is the limiting drip rate in terms of litres per year when the uh, aerosol would become the dominant form of uh, a particular element. Um, so. At hiatuses, then, one would expect to see uh, a different kind of chemistry that's reflecting what's coming in from the air, and also, as, as Sylvia has mentioned, the bacterial response to that, and, and certain bacteria, you know, if there's something coming in from the air which is, say, phosphorus-rich or nickel-rich, there will be bacteria around which will, which will have um, geochemical, biogeochemical pathways that can take advantage of that, and they may be able to fix uh, that particular element on, um, on, on the surface. So I think that looking at the geochemistry of hiatuses, I think, is a, is a fruitful area for future research. So in these fluid-controlled responses, then, we've got the high-flux business with the coarse colloids and compared with the fine colloids at low flux, but we've also got this issue of the dregs. Sometimes the, we, we, we have a signal from the dregs instead. And then we've got pyrocalcite precipitation that might be due to seasonal drought or it might be due to seasonal PCO2. Um, there is actually an independent way to check on the PCO2, and that is using uh, sulfate. Sulfate completes with carbonate to get into a calcium carbonate. If you have a high pH situation, the carbonate ion is relatively abundant compared with bicarbonate, and uh, that means that sulfate can't compete so well to get into calcium carbonate. But at lower pHs, the sulfate can compete better. And so, these are synchrotron maps of sulfate. Uh, this is sulfur, but it, we, we, know it, we know it's sulfate. Um, and there are seasonal variations in the abundance of sulfate. It's not quite as neat as the, as the zinc signal, but it's, it, it's certainly there. Um, and this is a okay, this OBSite, where the CO2 varies quite a lot significantly seasonally, and, and the patterns match up. So um, Peter Wynne was involved in this, this work, and so because we know that this is a stalagmite forming during the late 1970s, we've compared it with the rainfall records and so on, and uh, the snow melt, and it seems that um, the interpretation we have is that the high zinc is actually during the, the autumn. It's not necessarily the time when there's highest infiltration, which occurs during the snow melt, but it's the time of year when um, the, the environment is most uh, sensitive to this. And if you use that to fix the time of year, you can then work, try and work out when the sulfate is, is working, and then so we have these high sulfate periods which correspond um, to, the, uh, uh, to the summer, and whereas you get a relatively long period of high temperatures above the cave temperature in the summer, the amount of speleothem growth is less because the speleothem is growing s slower in the summer. So the sulfate then can be an independent way of looking at, um, at the seasonal PCO2 uh, variation. Now, this next section is one which is covered quite well in the textbook, and I haven't really got more to say than I have in Chapter 8 of the, of the textbook. Um, we're looking at the way in which uh, the concentration of elements in calcium carbonate is different from their ratio to calcium uh, in the water, because according to the partition coefficient, there should be a, a, a fixed fiddle factor. In practice, there often isn't. And I really, it's only when writing that chapter that I really fully understood what was, what the complexities are. And actually, there isn't anywhere else in the Spiliothem literature where these issues are addressed, and certainly not in my previous papers. Um, so this, these diagrams are really just taken directly from this chapter. So if you're, if you're interested in trying to get at the theoretical side of partitioning, I'd uh, encourage you to have a look at that, uh, that stuff. It's basically saying there are, there are lots of different controls. Um, they're not quite what they seem to be. People sometimes talk about the rate of precipitation as a control on trace elements. It's actually a bit more complicated than that. It's not just the, uh, 
the rate, it's also how the crystal grows. So this relates back to what Sylvia was saying. It, it goes back to the growth um, mechanism. Um, it's true that at, at fast growth rates, the um, away from equilibrium, the partition coefficients all tend towards one because more or less um, uh, everyone that's queuing in the bus stop gets on the bus. Um, whereas if it's um, if it's uh, slow growing, there's much more discrimination. But the models, the theoretical models that are developed for this actually are inadequate. They don't actually explain the behaviours that are uh, observed. And so uh, people who are specialists in crystal growth then actually look at um, these sorts of things. These are uh, atomic force microscope images actually looking at how the crystal is growing. And this is actually one thing I would disagree with Sylvia, about a terminological point, I think you can't restrict the term crystal to to lattices that are bounded by flat faces. And that was a definition that was used by mineralogists who were, in the old days, just looking at nice crystals as hand specimens. I think it's better to think of the uh, crystals as, as being an area where you have a uniform lattice of some sort. Um, and then you don't have to worry. I mean, it's true that there are some flat faces here, but then if you look at it on a larger scale, it isn't at all flat. So you, it, it, gets you into a, it gets you out of trouble if you don't have to restrict the definition in that way. So um, we now know that uh, the incorporation of elements actually is different on slightly different growth sites on the surface. Um, and so you know, the partition coefficient co concept is, is certainly flawed because it doesn't deal with all of these issues. It's, a, it, no, it's okay as a generalization, but um, it, it doesn't, uh, in, in detail, it doesn't quite work. And so, you know, at the cutting edge of what's going on here, people like Diorio are actually revisiting the classic um, um, Burton, Cabrera, and Frank theory back from 1950 and saying we have to look again at some of the assumptions that underpin that f theory and, and think about things in a, in a different way. Now, as a result of that, um, it turns out that um, un things that had not been predicted by classical theory actually can dominate the chemistry of stalagmites. And the classic example then is this business of strontium um, variation. And this is strontium getting lower. There's strontium getting lower every year, every time that phosphorus is peaking. And this kind of relationship is very, very common. And it is the case, it seems that in many cases, that strontium variation is, um, is the best indication we have of the annual signal in stalagmites. And yet this is something that is not predicted by, by conventional theory. It's something that's to do with the growth mechanism. Um, so Claire Smith was, used this phenomena in, in terms of um, you know, trying to um, have an algorithm for, for working out rates of growth of spilithems from the trace element profile. And a, a particularly spectacular example of this is these very fast-growing stalagmites from hyperalkaline environment, which is in work that uh, Adam has submitted to GCA. Um, very fast-growing stalagmites. You would expect kinetics to be dominant, and indeed they have a spectacular effect. So in the water, strontium and cobalt are not very well correlated. In the stalagmite, they're incredibly strongly correlated because of these kinetic effects. So the crystallographic responses then um, you know, we think that these elements should be the ones that are best behaved and should obey the partition coefficient rule, but there are still uncertainties there, and certainly uncertainties of plus or minus 30% um, on their abundance. And if you go away from those simple uh, alkaline earth elements, then partition coefficients don't have a single, uh, simple meaning. So plus or minus 30% could be entirely due to these um, crystallographic type processes, but um, uh, yes, and and yet, you know, they they're actually very, can be very characteristic of, of things that go on uh, during the year. On the other hand, if you get very big variations, as we've seen in magnesium and strontium, that co-vary, you can interpret that in terms of the water. And that is, that's, those are situations where they, that does dominate over these crystallographic effects. So then, if we treat trace elements as a black box, then we are limiting the richness of our interpretations. If we understand the processes better in caves, it gives us a more chance of understanding what these patterns are telling us. And combining low resolution and high resolution analysis can be quite a powerful way of understanding the signals. Um, 
and be curious about where your trace elements have come from. It's a bit like your food. If you go to the supermarket, do you worry about where it's come? You know, how's the chicken been raised? All this kind of stuff. Um, so, the trace elements may tell you about hydrology, they may tell you about cave ventilation. The processes, in some cases, can scale up over time and be present in long time scales as well as short time scales. Growth kinetics, in a way, is a nuisance, but on the other hand, it helps make strontium a very reliable indicator of um, annu annuality in uh, these spilly attempts. So, that's it. Thanks very much. Right. Um, I, I th uh, okay, so um, Megan is concerned about what the, if you had a ripening process going on, what impact would that have on trace elements and stable isotopes? Uh, this is quite a frontier area, actually, and, and I have to um, apologize that I've just recently realized that w I started talking about ripening 20 years ago when I was looking in glacial environments. And uh, I found, in looking at ancient ice ages, that, that evidence of rock flour from the glacier having crushed them. And yet I found stable isotopes that implied that dolomite had recrystallized in the marine environment, and because I was getting quite heavy stable isotopes, meaning cold water um, temperatures. But uh, only two years ago have I realized that what I was seeing were actually dolomite concretions growing in glacier marine sediments. So I think, I, I now think that that particular dolomite ripening idea I had, I was actually on the wrong track. However, of course, it, it then, you then get into the literature about ripening. I mean, ripening is an important fundamental principle, as, as Sylvia has mentioned. We did try some experiments um, in the 1990s where we, I, I, I took some um, modern calcareous oozes and uh, we, we left them in, in contact with Antarctic water for a couple of years to see if we could see any, any signs of, of fluid um, solid interaction. You know, because you might expect, because there were there things like nano, um, there were nanoplankton there, little coccoliths with uh, submicron sized um, particles there. So we're hoping to actually see whether we could directly observe that. And, and the sensitivity of the experiment was such that if there had been 2% recrystallization over two years, we would have seen it. And actually, we didn't see any change um, in that. I mean, we, we never published that. That's the trouble with negative results. You, know, you don't publish them. Um, so we know it's not going to happen instantaneously. It's true, that, as, as Sylvia said, that if you have an amorphous phase or a batterite phase, they can transform very, very quickly. But if you just have very small calcite crystals, uh, I think we don't really know how long it would take for them to, um, uh, for those crystal boundaries to shift. Now, if that, and, and then when they do shift, the question is how open is the chemical system going to be? Um, if the change is very, very local, involving just a small enlargement, you know, you could argue that may operate in a fairly closed environment. So when it comes to these chemical zones that I mentioned, you know, at least with the OBS sample, you could see that we had zones that were um, kind of micron scale, and they were and they were actually outlining the crystallites in there. So you know, in that case, you, you'd be pretty confident that you've got a primary chemistry. But there may be a lot of other cases where you can see some vague patterns, and you're not really quite sure about how distinct they are. And then you've, you've got to be cautious, as, as Sylvia said, and, and, and not necessarily assume that the, the, the chemistry is primary. 
dust. Okay, well, in, in the... Yeah. Um, I mean, the particular caves that we looked at, um, we know that it is not controlled by the water because the water composition does not change in the, over the year in those particular sites. Now, um, it, it, did, did you mean the seasonal change in dust deposition? Right. Yes, if, if you're getting annual strontium isotope change, that, that sounds really exciting and that will be, as you say, it could be really diagnostic of sources. Um, but you do, you do need special conditions in order to get a signal of that sort to be transmitted to the cave sufficiently quickly. Because um, we know with, with something that's um, you know with something that's PCO2 um, controlled, then that's easy because we know that the air circulation can can penetrate deep into a cast. If it's something that's water controlled, then you've got to deliver. You now, if you've got to, if it's arriving from the atmosphere, it's then got to be delivered very very quickly, instantaneously through fracture-fed flow. So you, you do need specific circumstances where that will occur. And, and of course, those sorts of drips are the, also the ones which will show seasonal variations in oxygen isotopes as well. So, um, you know, and we know obviously that there's some stalagmites will show that property and some will not. Well, um, so strontium is an element that, that's quite large in relation to calcium. Um, so it can substitute for calcium, but it's, um, there's no one here who's very large. So I can say if you're on an airplane, there's someone really large sitting next to you, then, you know, they can fit, but it's a little bit of a, little bit of a squeeze. So strontium's like that. Um, it's is also possible for strontium being a large, um, it can also, because it's relatively large, it's also attracted to defect sites. And this is where there's something, a mismatch in the crystal lattice, um, such that it doesn't quite line up in the normal way. There's maybe a screw distil dislocation, an edge or a point dislocation there. There's a defect. And usually that defect permits larger ions than normal to attach themselves there. So, if there's a defect site that's empty and you're a strontium ion, you know, it's a bit like if the first class section is empty and there are big seats there, you know, you would just sit down in them, wouldn't you? Um, however, usually what happens is that there's something already there. Uh, so, a phosphate ion or uranium or something like that. Elements that can bind very, very tightly to, um, uh, to uh, those defect sites will have preferentially. So it's like if someone's actually bought a first class ticket, well, they get that first class seat and you only get that seat if, it's, if you're upgraded, if, 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 it's, if it's empty. Um, so, so strontium's proper place, as you might say, is substituting for calcium. It's a divalent alkaline earth element. It should substitute for calcium, but it's quite large. And so that limits um, how easily it does that. It has the alternative possibility, but it's at the back of the queue. And if, if the other elements are more abundant, the lead and the zinc and so on, they will, they will have priority. And one of the complications about these um, defect sites is if you have something like phosphate coming in, and phosphorus does absorb very strongly to them, phosphate iron is trivalent, it's three minus, and so immediately you, you have a charge problem. You've got um, the, the charge is different, and so that then may attract another element, like say sodium, to come in, um, which has also doesn't have the typical plus two or minus two charge. And so you, you basically have a kind of, everyone piles in, all these strange ions pile in and, and try and, um, well, it's like, um, it's like one of these, what do they call them, these raves where it's advertised on the uh, internet and then people say there's a party here and everyone piles in um, to this particular place. So it's, you know, so you, you get an impression of something that is not orderly and well behaved. And, and that's, uh, and yet, because the annual process of delivery of humix with, with phosphate and other ions does occur very, very regularly, it's, it's like clockwork. 
And I remember Andrea saying that he never ceases to marvel at the fact that in Ernesto Cave, every year, for thousands of years, there's always been what he calls the ink that's come in every autumn. It's, it's quite amazing, really, because you know, obviously the, the, um, the climate varies from year to year, but one thing that doesn't vary is every year the vegetation dies back as, as the autumn comes through. Um, so it's really one of the most dependable things in cool, temperate environments that, that would yield a chemical signal.